Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and uh, this morning when I first got up, I was reading a little bit through my social media news feed, and I came across something by Paul Carter, and uh, he kind of echoed a bunch of points about the line that it works for him as one of the worst lines you can use, and let's keep in mind, you know, Paul is an elite level power lifter, coaches a lot of lifters, he even coaches some bodybuilders and other things, very, very well known in the fitness community. Paul's one of those guys that I like, though, because I can disagree with Paul on a lot of things, and I do disagree with Paul on a lot of things, but I still appreciate the way that he presents his case. He's just, he's a good writer. And I just appreciate his writing style in general and his perspective, even on points when I disagree with him, because he still creates an interesting perspective, and I actually appreciate that. Um, but let's talk about the point he made, because it's one that I make pretty regularly, and I want to just talk about that, because it's a great concept. So let me put on this plus five hat of weaponsmithing, do a little bit of crafting here. And uh, let's talk about that idea. Yeah, that is actually one of the worst reasons you can ever have to do something that someone else has done is to say that it worked for them. And there's a reason why. Because the point is, oftentimes people say that, but you have to go, did it actually work for them? Like, the actual thing that they did, was it in isolation? Or was it actually a negative that they did, but they did so much other stuff right that they got around doing something really stupid? And that's a point that people don't always grasp, and they don't always know how to tell the difference there. You know, for example, um, they'll look at something and be like, wow, this guy did this whatever arm routine, and his biceps grew a lot. And he has amazing biceps, and he's big and lean and ripped or whatever. And you go, well, how do you know that his bicep routine was that great? How do you know he just didn't use a lot of drugs and isn't genetically gifted in his biceps? In which case, he could have done literally anything for his biceps, and they would have gotten big. Now, on the other hand, that doesn't mean that what he did wasn't awesome. He might have actually come up with an absurdly effective bicep routine in training. I mean, so I don't want people to think that when I say that, that that means the person did something wrong either because they actually might have come up on something that was pretty close to ideal. But the thing is, when you're assessing what people do and assessing the way that they do things, you can't just go, well, it worked for him. And here's what I mean. I think Eric Helms uh, always had the best analogy I've heard of, of that. You don't use the fact that someone made it through a door uh, as proof that the method they used to open the door was ideal. Meaning, uh, people get an argument sometimes on the internet about the best way to open a door is should you hop on your, your left foot three times in a circle or on your right foot three times in a circle? And what do you need to chant before you open the door? People overcomplicate things sometimes and they actually do things ass backwards and really condol with really convoluted methods sometimes and then attribute the fact that they managed to open the door and walk through it as proof that their pre-door opening ritual was the most was really effective. And it may not be the case. It might have been as simple as they just needed to open the door. And in many cases, in a lot of lifting routines, people's results are based upon the fact that they lifted weights. They used progressive overload and resistance to make a muscle bigger. That, that's actually sometimes all it is. It sometimes didn't have to do with the fact that they picked an amazing rep and set scheme. Um, and then the other thing to consider there is that uh, when you see various tools that people use, such as uh, when I bring up the altitude mass, that's a great one. People say, but this champion used the altitude mass and he still won. Well, you have to look at that and go, but did the altitude mask help or hurt him? And here's what I mean. I've had people come in here and even say the same thing. I use these altitude masks and uh, my stamina improved during my training time with it. And my response would be, yeah, because you worked on your stamina. It wasn't the mass that did it. In fact, you probably only gained 90% of the stamina that, that you uh, should have gained. Had you taken the mask off, you would have gained even more. You improved your stamina because you worked hard in spite of the stupid ass mask, not because of it. Because scientifically speaking, the mask should actually make it slightly harder for you to improve. It should actually impede your results. But you can work hard enough on things to overcome stupid things sometimes. And a lot of champions do that. And that's a textbook example. I mean, the guys who use the mask will know, yeah, their stamina improved because they worked on it. But the mask made them gain a little less stamina than they should have gained. But sometimes someone is so genetically gifted and they work so hard that they overcome doing stupid things. They get enough other stuff right. And sometimes the things that they get right was simply picking the best parents. Picking the right parents before you're born now, obviously, you can't control that, so that's a joke, but sometimes that's the smartest thing anyone does. 
and sometimes that lets them get away with doing really stupid stuff that's going to take someone who's less gifted is going to take them out of the game it's going to take them out of the competition uh, because it's so impeding but someone else can have enough ge genetic gifts that they could do something stupid like wear the mask and not get full results of their training and still be better than their competition because they're just so much more gifted than they are another factor to consider now Another beautiful point that Paul raised, and I love this one because it's one that I highlight all the time, and that's about injuries. If someone reached a goal that they set really well and they, they are very successful at whatever body composition goal or strength goal or whatever they set was, when people look at their methods and say, well, they worked, we say, well, how many injuries did they have? And if you say, well, they had five injuries along the way, major injuries, well, I would say their methods don't work. Their methods were terrible. Because if you're getting injured, injury is never part of fitness. Anytime you get an injury, a major injury, something went wrong. Now, oftentimes that happens out on a playing field, and that's understandable for an athlete. But if you're getting injuries from what you are doing in training, and we occasionally make mistakes, guys. Everyone will occasionally get an injury. You know, something will get stretched or pulled a little bit. It does happen, and sometimes it's a simple case of not having done a movement for a few weeks and coming back to it really hard and heavy will sometimes even pull something um, without taking a week or two back into it. But you know what? That's also making a mistake. You're using a method that doesn't work. And so this whole thing, though, if you see people say, well, it worked for him, but he had five different muscle, major muscle injuries or connective tissue injuries over the course of three or four or five years getting there, that's a totally unacceptable rate. Uh, it could be argued that, again, their methods didn't work because they're getting hurt a lot. And if you're getting hurt in training with any degree of regularity, not a one-off thing, your methods don't work. They suck. They're terrible. Because other people could use methods that get you there just as quickly as you did without the injury. So their methods are literally 10 times better than yours. If your methods are causing injuries or they're causing chronic pain in your body, um, there's something wrong with your methods. They don't work at all, no matter what the visual effect you guys see is. If, they, if people are getting tears and injuries from any method, it doesn't work. And then the other thing you've really got to look at is how do you know that their method was the best? Meaning if that person only used themselves as a sample and they only tried two or three methods over the course of their entire experience reaching a goal, when there are 15 or 20 different methods available, how do you know that five other methods wouldn't have gotten much faster results than they did? Again, it goes back to the point of opening the door. Just because someone made it through a door doesn't mean that they use the best or the most efficient method to get there. And that's another big factor there also is the time factor. Sure, a lot of people can spend enough years consistently working towards something and reach a goal. Meaning, we know in powerlifting, for example, uh, the more years a person consistently trains in powerlifting, the more their total increases, even usually with fairly bad methods. Even if they don't use that good of training methods, there is a direct correlation between years spent injury-free under the bar and what their powerlifting totals and work score looks like. However, um, the different methods used can affect how fast you get there. Meaning, does it take you five years to do something you could have done in three? Well, if you could have done something in three years instead of five reaching the same goal, you got to step back and ask, well, while that person enjoyed their journey maybe, and they reach their goal, is that really what they need to be teaching others is any sort of best way to get there. Again, just because they reached a goal doesn't mean it's really ideal. And that's kind of the point we come to with a lot of things. It's okay to have slower progress if it makes you happy and you're not in a competitive environment and um, you're training for fitness and joy, that's fine because it is all about the journey. A lifestyle is about the journey. But when you start coaching methods to others, as methods to get them to a goal efficiently, you don't have, you can't really be trying to tell people that uh, taking twice as long to reach the same goal or put in twice the work to reach the same goal is really ideal. Again, unless they're happy with that and accept, and they can accept that. But when you start teaching them it's the fastest way, and you don't have any evidence other than your own anecdote, you got a problem. That's why we have science, and that's why we have studies, and we study the human body and study exercise science and nutritional science because. People who only have their own experience have a limited pool of information to draw from to determine what's the most efficient way to reach a goal. What's the most efficient way to open the door? Because they only have time to test and time so many methods. And you know, the human body only has so much adaptation curve with everything also. They can only do so many different things with just their own body to try to find that. 
Whereas in an exercise scientist, you can take a pool of a hundred different athletes, test all these different methods and get an idea of which ones work fastest for what percentage of people. Cause that's the other big thing you have to factor in. Um, the best method to reach a goal for one person might actually only work as the best method for 20% of the population who trains. And so looking at these statistics and looking at these things more closely with larger pools gives people a better idea of what's most likely to be the most effective method. Or um, if you have several different methods available uh, and one of them seems to consistently do it faster for most people, but it comes in at least number two for all the other people, then maybe you don't need to find the ideal method for larger populations to teach people unless you're coaching on a one-on-one -on -one basis, which is different. Um, but you can at least find the methods that are most likely to give them close to the fastest or best results possible with the lowest injury rate. And sometimes a large demographic to draw from gives you that. And that's why scientific studies and researchers who really do care about these gains, you know, people say, well, I don't care about science. Well, you should, because a lot of these researchers, again, guys like Dr. Brad, they really do care about this stuff. They're passionate about finding the truth. Uh, they really and truly want to find the best ways to get people the results because it's their passion, it's what their PhD is in, it's what their research is in, and it's what they love. And they want to see other people excel based on their knowledge. So they are going out of their ways to really get the best information they can. And again, it's sometimes up to you to learn to apply that. But that's oftentimes uh, better than just having your own anecdote. And I would argue at the end of the day, though, the uh, people who are going to have the best information are people who are able to combine the two together. They're able to look at their own anecdote and what they've been able to do right and wrong for themselves or other people they've coached or taught and be able to look at the sum of the scientific data and make sense of it all uh, so that they can actually teach people how to find the best methods that are going to work for themselves based upon this, the total sum of the knowledge available, the combination of personal experience along with being able to look at and assess the scientific research. But ultimately, guys, at the end of the day, the proof that something is an effective method of, well, it worked for him, is actually really a terrible method of determining the best way to do things. Because, you know, otherwise, before long, people will be looking at people like Rich Piana and going, well, his eight-hour arm workout gave him massive arms. <laughs>